Hey everyone, my name is Andy Raitano. I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. Here I have Zachary Johnson, who's the other half of this project, and I'm really glad he, uh, he's here. Uh, I think the best way to explain this thing is probably just take off a demo. So if you see the URL down there, browse to nestspector.com. Uh, hop on, and let's do this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so this is an unmodified uh, Super Mario Brothers cartridge back from 1985. That's a new one. <laughs> Come on, Zach, beat World 1 1 in front of everybody. You can do it. You're so close. Unless they spawn something. Oh my oh. god. <laughs> oh, 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 I don't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Hey, nice job. Uh, is this Mario how you remember it? This is not Mario. <laughs> Might as well keep playing. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, look at that. Ooh. Holy smokes, we have 62 people on right now. That's great. All right, I'm going to cut you up. I think you broke the running I'm going to cut you off. All right, I thought we would run more demos. Oh, we got another one. I think. So this is uh, the original Tetris, the Nintendo version. <laughs> so yeah, this mode is you're actually voting on the next piece, so you're deciding Zach's fate. Uh, sometimes we push it a little bit outside that's the normal not, pieces. That's not a yeah, normal that, piece. yeah, that's not. A <laughs> uh, Looks like you're doing great. Look at your line count. I told the sound guy they can turn it down because it gets pretty obnoxious when you corrupt the sound registers. Is that an ostrich? Oh, it's <laughs> I think this is, was the ostrich for yeah. a second. <laughs> Come on, you guys! <laughs> Come oh, on! Well, look how fast it's going. Hey, come on. Beautiful. Let's go. Oh. oh. This is fun to watch. I'm going to just do this for 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm cutting you off. OK. So what just happened? Um, <laughs> so. Uh, my name's Andy Raitano. I mentioned before, I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft, and I'm re really glad Zach's here. Um, we had met down in Fantastic Arcade, and we kind of have equal shares in this project, and it's what really got me into web development, which is uh, interesting. But if you want to follow either of us on here, we do a lot of dev work, uh, not just NES. Um, yeah, uh, here's my ham radio call sign if you want to talk to me on that, and you don't use Twitter. Uh, so this is my first computer. Um, it was a Commodore 64 we found in the garbage with uh, the A and the D key missing, so it was a real pain to type load or run. Um, 
but the, the interesting thing about it is the, the processor is uh, 6510, which is a 6502 derivative. And uh, 6502 is a very, very common microcontroller uh, or CPU or processor, whatever you'd like to call it. It was in the Apple IIe, the uh, ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro, uh, but more, most importantly to me, it was in the NES. And uh, I had Maniac Mansion, which is kind of a prototypical adventure game, like a point and click, and I wanted to rewrite Maniac Mansion in BASIC, and then I found BASIC to be too slow, so I started to learn 6502 assembly language. Um, and thankfully, the Nintendo Entertainment System was actually a 6502-based system, and this was my first uh, gaming console that I really fell in love with. And uh, it's running at a blazing fast 1.79 megahertz and uh, has a whopping two kilobytes of RAM. And when I speak to younger crowds, uh, I'm usually like, that's like 16 tweets, that's like nothing. And when I speak to this crowd, I'm like, it's actually like eight tweets, it's because it's Unicode, but. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but so, I, you know, I was experimenting with 6502 microcontroller, and uh, I had a lot of fun working with uh, this simplified computer architecture. It was something that I can, um, you know, I can learn about how registers work and how, uh, how the computer's actually operating, because when you code an assembly, you're working at such a low level. So I started moving on to working with uh, the Sega Genesis, which is a 68K-based processor, and uh, started trying to invoke the video chip to create this kind of algorithmic uh, uh, video uh, live performance uh, art for backing tracks or uh, visualizations behind an artist who may be also using a Game Boy. That's uh, my friend Mark Mono Deer, and we're like kind of, you know, syncing up his Game Boy stuff, which is Z80 plus their audio unit and my video stuff, and it's the best work because I can do all the hard coding over a cup of coffee, then show up to a gig and hit the B button and drink a beer with the other hand. Um, but in 2000, I'm an electrical engineer by trade. Uh, I was in the industry for about nine years before I went on to Microsoft. And uh, this was a project I was, I was really excited about. Uh, I started do developing larger games, but there's really no way to debug them. You don't have a printf, you don't have a serial port, you don't have anything. So <clears throat> I built this board, which is a, I just called the dual port RAM board. Uh, that's a replacement for that two kilobytes of RAM in the NES. And what's cool about it is I can uh, read and write values in the, uh, in the console, and the console has no idea that anything's wrong. The game runs as normal. Um, and so my computer, my host computer, has full rewrite access to the whole uh, bit of memory, but you know, if it's unplugged and I plug in a game, it runs exactly like it did uh, if it was unmodified. So it, you know, that's what that looks like, where you have uh, 2K of static RAM, and uh, you have your address lines, it's a 12-bit address bus, uh, your control lines, that's chip select, output enable, and read write, and then your data, and it's an 8-bit bus. Uh, but dual point RAM is a specialized piece of logic where you actually you have that 12-bit bus, the 8-bit data bus, and the control lines, but it's exposed on a second port. And every single byte in there actually has arbitration logic to determine who can read and write. So basically, I hooked up an Atmega uh, 644, which is you know, akin to, say, what's in your Arduino, like an Atmega 328 and exposed that, um, that block of memory to a UART. So now I can control it from my computer and start modifying it that way. And this was just a part I was geeked about on DigiKey, but basically, if you're familiar with the uh, back of the NES, there's an additional port on the right there. It looks like a headphone port, but that's actually a USB to serial uh, port they can plug in. And then I started writing host software to start messing with games. Uh, so now that I have this ability and I'm like, in the system, I wanted to create these kind of what-if peripherals that could have existed 30 years ago, but just really didn't. And uh, one of my favorite games of all time is a game called Blades of Steel. It's a hockey game that uh, was really intensely into with my cousin. We got into two separate fist fights over it. We both were punished for a really long time. Uh, but it doesn't show you the score, and it always really kind of annoyed us, so this was the thing I wanted to do. So uh, I'm reading all, it's this uh, read-only kind of project where I'm reading, uh, I found the RAM values for uh, where the score is, the period, which teams are being selected, and then also now I can check when it increments by one. So I was able to click a relay and turn on the siren uh, and then play just this klaxon wave <laughs> on the back, and then we were like, oh, what if Contra like lit up the room when you shot, and had like this muzzle flash. <laughs> you actually, you can hear the relay click. That uh, but then I was like, um, I finally went on to actually use it for what I was going to use it for, which was to view memory in games. So I wrote this thing in Pygame that was like a live hex editor, and I said, what happens when you start pushing values outside of their original um, 
what the engine would do? And the answer is you go into unmapped ROM and you don't know what's gonna happen. So here's Simon Belmont in Castlevania whipping a treasure chest into a Medusa head because I went past the third whip, which is like the super morning star or whatever. And I always wanted to be a game genie when I grew up, uh, <laughs> which is a cheap device for the NES. So we stuff it, middle school guidance counselor. It was a legitimate career choice because I'm talking about it on stage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so I was down in Fantastic Arcade showing uh, a video game called Super Russian Roulette that I've been working on, and um, it probably is exactly what you think it is, uh, <laughs> uh, which is a party game for the NES that uses the Duck Hunt gun. Uh, it's really a drinking game. Uh, and I happen, I brought my own console, and I happen to bring this one because, like I said, if you're not hooked up, it just runs like a stock system. And uh, somebody had come up to me and said, hey, you know, I do NES stuff too, but not exactly like you do. Um, check out the shader I wrote. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty accurate if you have like a dirty card. Because you can see like the tiles being uh, manipulated there. And that turned out to be Zach. And we got to talking and I was like, cool, I didn't even know you can have a shader in a browser. I mean, that's, I'm used to embedded uh, low level like uh, uh, microprocessor work and kind of straight C in real time systems. That's what I did for a long time. So I was like, huh, when I tried JavaScript, I was kind of grumpy about it, but I was like, whoa, that's actually really awesome. And uh, he's like, yeah, check this out. And he shows me this kind of massively multiplayer gorillas. And to me, this is like the first open source game, like ever, because it ran in QBasic. Uh, and then um, this was like a port to make it like multiplayer. And I was like, oh, do you need to know an IP address? Like, I didn't even know they can just go open up a browser and start participating in these, these multiplayer experiences. And then when I saw this, I was like, uh, it's also Zach's work. Uh, it's a massive multiplayer joust, which is kind of a more common game. Yeah, and, and he's like, opens up like three tabs and we're like jousting on the different tabs and I open up my computer and I'm in. And all I had to do is go to a URL. And we just started brainstorming and we said, what if we, kind of democratize that RAM and we give that power to the audience and then somebody who thinks they're really good at a video game, we could take that away from them. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I was like, cool, let's exchange info. I'll go back to New York and you go back to Minneapolis and uh, we'll talk about that. And he's like, no, I'm doing it now. And he goes, he goes back to his Airbnb and this is what we had the very next day. Now, I have a hardware panel speaking about the roulette game in 48 hours and comes back and we're like, whoa, cool. And this is, this is Nest Spectre version one and it was born in like 14 hours or something like that. And I was like, this is blowing my mind. So um, we were like, what can we find in Contra? What can we mess with? So we found some basic stuff like your lives and uh, you know, corrupting palette. And uh, we left the slide in because we were like, just want to show we we're still playing games and partying and drinking beers, but through the power of like Node and Socket IO, we were able to prototype this thing in time for my talk. Uh, and this is kind of when we knew we had something. So in Contra, you're supposed to get to this wall and like it's a run and gun, so you like, you just Rambo dude and you blow a hole in the wall and infiltrate the base, I think it's what it says on the screen. But we jumped over the wall. Uh, and now you're an unmapped ROM and it's spawning enemies in later stages and we're like, this is great. This is, we are, we are doing something new with an, a stock cartridge that we didn't even have to modify. Like you could probably do that with a ROM hack, but we didn't have to. Uh, so this was just kind of to prove that we're still working on, you can see on our screens, we didn't see these photos till after. Uh, on the bottom right, we're still live coding this right before my panel, because we're like, we want to show everybody. So at the end of my hardware panel, we took 10 minutes and showed everyone, and it worked perfectly. And I was sort of blown away, and it was good that I was kind of shook, that I was like, oh, you know, this is awesome. Um, and since then, I've been getting a lot more into web development. So just uh, the architecture of the whole system basically comes down to, I explain the NES console, sp speaking USB to Pi serial script, and it's basically checking this node server um, that's in all of you are the web apps, and this is running on Microsoft Azure, and uh, using Socket.io, wrapping web sockets, you're all able to interact and tell the NES what RAM it needs to write. And we like to say you're the actual ghosts. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, here's the stack, you know, again, Node, Socket.io, and Express the server of a web page, and it's all running on um, the Microsoft Cloud. So um, just wanted to let you in on a bit of motivation. Last year, I founded a company called BatLab Electronics, and the idea was that we would, or I would, <laughs> um, 
design cartridges not to play commercial games, but to start releasing your homebrew software. So I started routing boards and giving basically, you can't buy a dev kit for the Sega Genesis or the NES, so I was trying to create a dev kit so you can cheaply release your homebrew software, otherwise you have to do it through an emulator. So it's like my original design shop in Brooklyn and some Gerbers, which are like the source code for a PCB. And it started, it was nice to be like a design house, but then we started making more and more boards for our friends' carts. Like on the bottom right is a, a music car for a band called Anamanaguchi that writes their music on the NES. And uh, people like having a physical cart because you go into Barnes and Noble and there's remasters of Pink, uh, Dark Side of the Moon and people like having a vinyl, people like holding things and it's very exclusive. Um, and then the develop, we started developing all our, all, uh, our own tools. You know, I have access to open source libraries. I have access to databases in the cloud. So now I can augment some pretty, um, pretty basic stuff and make it very, very intelligent. So like, for instance, on the top right, that's a Black & Decker four slice toaster oven that's been modified into a reflow oven to solder these boards. And I'll tell you that the reflow profile, because I, send, I have a PID controller and a little Arduino on top, uh, it works better than a commercial oven. It's a JDEX standard. It beat the reflow profile works better than the $5,000 oven I purchased. And you can see it on the bottom left. The parts are shifting into place and it works great. And you know, I'm able to write this like uh, flashing software in, I wrote this in .NET and C Sharp, and now I basically have an NES cartridge making factory. Um, and it was all, you know, there's Raspberry Pis behind all those flashers. And now I have like my old like, kind of like crusty metalhead, you know, uh, old ex-bandmates and they're all like the best technicians I know because we're just developing these tools. We can leverage so much and kind of get ahead. Um, but like why, right? A lot of people are like, you know, I, I saw some great stuff where it was like adventures and, you know, useless hacking. I, I loved you know, Rachel's talk and Suze was speaking also about, um, you know, having these projects where you know, you're doing them, but not, not to meet some end goal. And the alternate, a lot of people say, why in the hell would you develop for a now 32-year-old machine? But a lot of people are like, oh, you're nostalgic for it, but I, I, wanna, I wanna propose that it's not just nostalgia. For me, the biggest one is the technical challenge. And it sounds like a bad thing when I like, you know, it sounds like I'm whining about the fact that there's 2K RAM on it, but I think working within technical constraints makes you a better developer. Like, this is the scariest thing in the world to me. For those unfamiliar, this is, this is you open up Unity and it's like, wow. It's like, a, it's like you're standing in front of like an easel and a canvas and you're like, wow, do I know how to paint? Do I know how to design? And you could be an awesome developer. It doesn't mean you're a good game developer. And you can use anything you, you want. You can use um, MP3s. You can open up Ableton and mix you know, live brass and like put any PNGs, uh, AVI, you could use any format you want and then you're like, wow, what kind of game do I make? And you have nothing to guide your hand, right? But when you're working in these constraints, like Super Mario Brothers, we just played it before and he went underground and he did all this, uh, you know, it's like he went into the castle and slid down the pole. You're looking at every single tile that makes up all of Super Mario Brothers. And a lot of people, there's like a trope where it's like, whoa, mind blown, the clouds are the same as the bushes. They are the same tiles. They're just re, uh, the palette swap to green instead of white and blue. And they're actually so efficient. On the bottom right, you see some like garbled uh, junk. And they're putting the level, um, the, the title screen map data, they're like, oh, we have a little room in the graphics data. Data is data, just put it in the graphics, um, which is really amazing. And I think it's really interesting that you need to switch hats constantly. I know it's kind of like a tired term, but you know, this, is this the work of an artist or is this the work of a technical uh, a developer? I, I really couldn't tell you um, from this picture because if you look at like that tunic and that heart and the potion, um, I guess it would be 2A, if we're like, so not bingo, but like battleship, right? Um, you see like, they they're taking advantage of the fact that sprites could be mirrored and create a whole object, but the key can't because a symmetrical key would look kind of dumb. So they have to use extra tiles, but they make space by taking advantage of the fact that they can have symmetrical uh, pieces. And now like, we're talking about like, being a clever designer and developer on a level playing field. And what I mean by that is like, look at this now. Super Mario is awesome, but they only have a background layer and a sprite layer, but on the left, it looks like they got a whole ton. I mean, you have these clouds doing this kind of parallax thing to uh, simulate distance, but then they put the sprites in front, so it looks like the mountain's there. And then the ninja's like in front, 
And even though the, on the right, it's kind of like a nonsensical effect, why would all the grass kind of do that? Um, it is really, it is really cinematic, right? Like it's, it looks, it looks awesome. Um, and also like sound design, like how, everyone thinks of NES being very primitive and you talk about square waves and triangles and things like that, but how do you convey a theme or a style with very, very simple synthesis? And uh, just briefly, the NES has two square waves, a four-bit triangle wave, uh, a white noise uh, channel, and uh, a sample channel that was seldom used. Um, and even though I really like the Mario song, this is the same exact audio hardware as uh, Pictionary, which everyone's gonna laugh at me, and they all laughed at me when I was a kid, because I rented Pictionary, and it's a crap port of a sort of already kind of boring game. But I turned it on, I was like, no, you gotta rent Pictionary. The music rules, and everyone made fun of me, and no one rented it. Now I get to prove it, hang on. Oh no, how do I stop this? Oh, sorry. I'm in the mirror, okay. Now I get to prove it, like, 25 years later. Turn it up. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Same exact instruments at your disposal. And listen to what this sounds like. And it was just a developer was very, very clever. Uh, for me, you know, my, that uh, roulette game has a Western theme, and we're like, how do we convey like this Morricone, like Good Bad and the Ugly bit? And we're like, okay. Like we'll use a square wave and have like this trotting whistle, and uh, we'll have like this strumming guitar. It's like arpeggiated and a shuffling like on a trail, and this plotting triangle. Oh, you don't see it. Sorry. Ah, it's not gonna work. <laughs> it's okay. But if you are, you know, that wasn't me. I didn't make that music. I just kind of said what I wanted. But the um, person who made it had never coded it in their life. But they, they, were able, they liked working within those constraints to make it because it was, it was fun. And I think if you're not interested in development, but you're a historian, you're interested. I mean, this is kind of corny, right? I'm like, oh, it's digital archaeology, you know, message in a bottle, cave painting. But how many, how many times have you had to scrub like curse words out of your code so it doesn't ship with it? Um, but like, what's hidden in these games? So I wrote a tool uh, called String Search. And um, it was written in C sharp, and I can only do it now because my computer's not a Pentium One, and I have a big hard drive. And I ran against collections on archive.org, and it basically looks for ASCII strings hidden in ROMs. Uh, so, who here has played Donkey Kong in an arcade? Did you know there's like a developer challenge hidden on a ROM? Like, if you look at 3F00 on a ROM, you get congratulation. If you analyze difficult this program, we would teach you, and they give you an extension to go work for them because they figured they'd rather you work for them than clone their game. They're like, this it, developer challenge is not a new thing. I, I, to me, this is the original developer challenge. And you've played the game as much as you can, and you can never trigger the string. There's no routine to draw to the screen. It's just hidden in the ROM. And this was my favorite one. It just says, um, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Spangenberg is a weenie. And I, the very first tech talk I've ever gave in 2011 was at Nerd Night, and it kind of spawned all this, so thank you, Louis Weil, who made me uh, go there. And I, I went, and I was like, I, my name my talk was that memory address, Jeff Spangenberg is a weenie, and um, nobody had really known about it. Uh, and the guy in the back is like, yeah, I know Jeff. Yeah, he is a jerk, or something like that. And then, and then months later, it kind of got popular and the cutting room floor picked it up and it ends with like, go ahead and hit me, I could use the money, like an altercation between a developer and, um, and a manager. Uh, what was really funny to me about that is like, who got the last laugh because there are tens of thousands of cartridges and embedded in the silicon. In the silicon is Jeff Spangenberg's Sweeney and that is immortal, I mean, that is eternal, I love that. Uh, and so my other favorite one is uh, Mad Professor Mariardi and it looks pretty lighthearted, there's some like goofy like chips and this, Little Albert Einstein fellas run away. Um, hidden in the mod files, hello, hacker, blanker. This is Matt Furness. Here's the deal. If you hack this game, I will find you wherever you are and break your legs, and that's a promise. <laughs> I also like that it's a knowable design. So if you're interested in computer architecture, like, it's really hard to do now. I can't learn assembly on x64, uh, but I can here. And you're looking at everything that makes the Nintendo. I can point at everything here and we can draw out the schematic. There's the 2A03, which is the CPU plus the APU, seeing the 6502 and those square waves I was talking about, 2K of RAM. Uh, 
uh, the GPU, which is the PPU, picture processing unit, and that's like the video card, that has 2K of RAM, uh, Octal D flip-flop, uh, uh, copy protection, the 3139, uh, some inverters, and the audio stage. You're looking at all of the Nintendo, and you can, you can learn about how a computer actually works by looking at this. And um, it's sort of a chance to outdo history, because like I've said before, I couldn't, even five years ago, I didn't have access to 3D printers or uh, photons that can like talk to the net. It's, it's pretty amazing. So I can, make a be I can make a better game, not because I'm a better developer, but because I'm a mediocre inter intermediate developer that has access to better tools. Like they were coding their stuff on these HPs, uh, and they were coding games for the NES on a 6502 computer that was not much faster. Uh, but I have stuff like the internet and source control and emulators and PCB services and, and test equipment. I could buy an oscilloscope for $300 that's digital with a memory depth that's like, it's amazing, it's cheap memory. So I was designing the board for my game and uh, I put eight megabytes on it. I just designed it that way. <laughs> it is 16 times bigger than the biggest release. And it was so I could do dumb stuff like, make the, the character on the Super Russian Roulette screen just rant forever and never shut up. So he goes on these one minute rants and uh, if you interrupt him, if you interrupt him, he gives you garbage for the rest of the game. He'll treat you like absolute trash, but it's almost impossible not to interrupt. Um, so he's just going on about eating tumbleweed, you gotta boil it if it's poisonous, and his grandma fell off four different horses, uh, horses, one of them twice, and you have to interrupt him because otherwise the game would never end, but then he's like, I wasn't finished. But I could only do that because I designed the hardware. And I like the idea that you can celebrate these old machines if you are fond of them, and you can leverage maker technology. Like, if I hook up an Arduino to uh, an NES, that's like, that's like eight times faster and with a ton more RAM. Um, and Rachel Weil spoke yesterday about Connectedness Project, which is an awesome, uh, she says it's not a modem, but it, it, it's a network uh, connected device using a photon that you can plug in a port to and start reading tweets on your Nintendo. And it's open source on GitHub, including the 6502 assembly. There's no closed doors there. There's nothing black box. She revealed all of it. And a very close friend of mine, um, this is one of my favorite projects of all time, so I just had to put it in here. Uh, I, have, I have some time, I'm just gonna play it. So this is the Atari 2600 games console from the 70s. It used to take these uh, big cartridges that had slot in the top, and uh, you could play some pretty amazing games. But generally most games only had simple sound effects, and the games that did have music... Atari 2600 is also 6502. So, what I decided to do with it uh, is try to actually push some music out of the device, and got myself an EEPROM programmer, uh, wrote a bit of software to convert everything uh, in a way where I can write music easily for it. And with these little um, daughter boards, it allows me to simply plug in the top, and you can see there I have my chip tune uh, in my machine. Hence, the Qatari 2600. <laughs> and this has everything I need on it to rock out. It has my EQ pedal, so I can add lots of 50 hertz to explode bass through subwoofers. The flange pedal, I have the hold ability to be able to hold notes and do whammy holds and things like that. And if I want to switch between tracks, I can power on and off and select a new track. And <laughs> awesome fun to play. And uh, I took it to Japan, and this is what happened. <laughs> yeah, 128 bytes of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> like, you find these things in the garbage, and look how many people he's entertaining with this little wood paneled device from like 78, right? Um, it's awesome, he's the best. Uh, so, Nest Spectre will be at Bash. Uh, Zach and I will be there, come talk to us. We have, um, if you see all these games here, most of them have demos besides the ones I showed you. I was just uh, stock of time, and you can see stuff like this. And this. And this. This one's my favorite. <laughs> I mean, Flash Joe is already sad enough, right? Uh, that's it. Thanks for coming. This was really awesome. Oh.